Welcome to FRC Media News for Thursday, August 22nd, 2019. I'm Keith Tebow. On tonight's program, we start our look at the candidates running for mayor in the city's preliminary election. We have an update on this weekend's Holy Ghost Feast, and we take a look back at the Salvation Army-sponsored block party held in the city last weekend. But first, as we do each week, we check in with the headlines and we bring in Phil Devitt, the city digital editor at the Herald News. Phil, welcome back. How are you? Thank you, Keith. How are you? I'm fine. I am doing well. And I'm talking and Siri goes off. So that's a good little thing. My, <laughs> phone, my phone, for some reason, took Phil as Siri. So hopefully I can uh, minimize that. I apologize for that. All right, let's get in right into the uh, news headlines of the week. Uh, first and foremost, following up on our conversation that we've talked about uh, in the past few weeks about the number of marijuana dispensaries in the city. Um, as you know, uh, Mayor Correa has issued 14 letters of non-opposition, and he was under fire for a few of them a couple of weeks ago, uh, two of them uh, being issued to the boyfriend, uh, rather the brother, of the mayor's live-in girlfriend. And as part of the state process, uh, these uh, entities need to hold uh, public hearings about their proposals, and the uh, two uh, incidences, the two locations for uh, this individual that is related to the mayor's girlfriend. That public hearing was held this past week and there was some opposition and some griping about those, uh, those, those two non, uh, letters of non-opposition. Yes, Keith. You know, these, as you said, public outreach meetings are, are pretty standard and in fact they're, they're state mandated as, you know, one step in, in, in the process on the way to uh, official state licensing. Um, you know, so these are usually cut and dry meetings, not very well attended, uh, not a lot of people getting up to speak for or against these facilities. Um, we cover them all regardless. Uh, in this case, we suspected that there might be some buzz, uh, and we were right um, uh, ever since the, the news came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that the company here that we're talking about is New Leaf Enterprises. Right. Uh, the president is uh, Pedro Fernandez, who, as you mentioned, Keith, is the brother of Mayor Jaisal Correa's girlfriend. Uh, and he also represents the only recreational mar marijuana company uh, thus far in Fall River to have been granted uh, two uh, city approvals, essentially, mm -hmm. um, for one facility on 2nd Street and one on South Main. And so, yes, there were complaints uh, at this meeting on uh, Tuesday night at Fall River Public Library, and there were some over the mayor's relationship to uh, the president of this company, but uh, a lot of the chatter was uh, about uh, traffic. What are we yeah. going to do about the buildup of cars in the neighborhoods? Um, is there going to be enough parking? Uh, there isn't enough parking. Uh, there are too many cars, that type of thing. Um, the attorney representing the company uh, told residents in turn that, look, there are now 22 of these facilities open in Massachusetts. It's not like it was at the very beginning where you had people coming from all over the place just to go to one location. So he's sort of saying, don't worry so much about traffic congestion. It won't be a big deal. Uh, of course, then you have some residents pointing to uh, Northeast Alternatives, mm -hmm. which is currently uh, open off of William S. Canning Boulevard, and, uh, and how much traffic has been pumping through uh, that little neighborhood since uh, that facility opened. So um, you had some complaints about that, and then, of course, uh, other people speaking out uh, about the mayor's relationship uh, to uh, the president of this company. Right. But uh, the meeting has been had, and now uh, we're on to the next step in the state licensing process. Right, and, and ultimately, um, the mayor has said this, ultimately um, he can um, offer opposition if he needed to, or, or uh, you know, offer these uh, letters of non-opposition, but ultimately it's the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, that, that issues uh, those licenses. So even though there are 14 letters of non-opposition, doesn't necessarily mean there'll be 14 uh, different uh, companies in Fall River who are either uh, providing uh, recreational sales or growing uh, of, uh, of marijuana here in Fall River. So that's always important uh, to bring up when we, when we talk about this issue. All right, up next, right. we also um, have been following with some interest uh, the incident around the Fall River Police Department. And uh, initially, Officer Michael Pessoa, uh, who is accused of using excessive force um, in uh, a couple of, uh, of instances earlier this year. While some court documents were released this week, Phil, 
And uh, in the course of the release of those documents, there was some testimony of some other police officers who were in effect testifying against Officer Pessoa. And those two officers, Thomas Roberts and Sean Aguiar, um, also found themselves into some potential trouble in admitting that they have filed some false police reports. So it looks like the uh, incidences here at the police department uh, are not necessarily getting any better. Uh, yeah, you, you can say that again, Keith. Um, we're, we're currently uh, still you know, connecting the dots in, in this um, and, uh, and reaching out for some follow-ups uh, based off of uh, the story we put together the other day in which we uh, uh, laid out that um, two of these officers had admitted to filing uh, false police reports. Uh, to set the, the scene a little bit, uh, Pessoa, who uh, is facing you know, 15 charges in, in connection to excessive use of force and uh, abuse of power, uh, he's been on unpaid leave since June. Uh, recently, uh, the four men that he is accused in this particular case of uh, abusing uh, had charges against them dropped. Right. And then two of these men uh, last week uh, also took the first step toward uh, suing the city. Mm. Um, one of them alleging that three officers stood by and, and watched as he was uh, attacked by Pessoa and possibly participated in uh, said attack. Um, uh, this week, the Herald News obtained documents showing that two of those officers, uh, as you said, Thomas Roberts and Sean Aguiar, were granted immunity mm -hmm. for testifying against Pessoa, and uh, in, in the course of uh, their testimony admitted to filing false reports as well. Uh, we reached out to uh, Chief Dupere uh, at the Fall River Police Department this week, who wasn't saying much other than that he learned of uh, this information tied to these officers uh, last week, uh, these officers are still employed by the department, but they've been assigned to uh, in-house duty uh, at the moment. Um, so this is just the latest development in a story that's been playing out for, for months here, and we're going to continue to follow it, Keith. Yeah, one of the reasons why it came out is that the district attorney's office felt that it's, it's their right to send the information about, even though there was immunity in terms of the initial case with Officer Pessoa for these two officers to testify, uh, yeah. Once they provided this information, uh, the district attorney's office felt that it was in, within their right to share that information about potentially filing false uh, uh, reports to the chief of police here in Fall River for whatever disciplinary action or internal mm -hmm. investigation that the city and the police department uh, want to undertake. So that's the important thing here that is sort of a connection between the district attorney's office feeling obligated to share this information with the chief of police here in Fall River. So uh, very complicated again, uh, multiple layers to this and, and uh, hopefully it's not anything that's more broad in terms of um, actions that are unbecoming of police officers here in Fall River. But again, I know the Herald News will, will continue to follow up and we will follow up as well. Finally this week, Phil, we just want to talk a little bit more about um, Stanley Street um, Resources, a star. Uh, we have talked about this in the past as well. They've been looking to expand to a location on Weaver Street. On two other occasions, their, their bid to uh, create a new treatment facility has been uh, denied due to zoning and, and other issues. Well, this week, it looks like they're going to try for a third time. Yeah, you know, uh, as, as uh, our reporter Joe Good wrote in her story today, maybe the third time will be the charm mm. for STAR. Uh, zoning issues appear to be the big thing here once again. Uh, STAR is uh, trying for a third time for uh, a $6.7 million uh, development uh, off of Weaver Street. Uh, Nancy Paul, the CEO of the uh, treatment facility, um, treatment agency, uh, telling us that our plans to build a facility this time in compliance with zoning mm -hmm. um, and focusing uh, its attention on outpatient care, though she says, um, you know, we should not, uh, this does not diminish the need um, for inpatient care as well. Right. The original facility, uh, I think, had a, 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 a 60 beds set mm -hmm. aside for um, a detox purposes. Um, so there's a bit of a shift in um, the building's purposes at this point. Um, North End neighbors protested the location originally. And then inspectional services, uh, you know, twice uh, rejected the permits. Uh, Glenn Hathaway in the building department tells us that, you know, this, uh, this third, um, uh, you know, uh, try is under review. So we'll see what happens. Uh, it's, uh, it remains to be seen if uh, they'll have to go for a fourth time. But uh, mm. STAR is certainly hoping they won't have to. Mm. 
All right, sounds good. All right, Phil, what's coming up over the next few days? Oh boy, we're uh, we're sinking our teeth into a bunch of things here, and uh, we always talk about the heavy stuff. So I, I try to find something positive <laughs> we can share with folks as well. Um, uh, you might remember uh, this uh, widespread um, tenant farm animal abuse in Westport back yeah. about four years ago now. Uh, a lot of those animals ended up going to a sanctuary in Tiverton, mm -hmm. and it turns out abused animals from everywhere go to this place. Yep. It's an incredible operation, and uh, our Deborah Allard got to stop by and, and meet some of the animals that we want to introduce you to uh, here at this uh, special, special location in Tiverton. Oh, sounds good. All right, Phil, we'll talk next week. Take care. Thanks, Keith. We'll have more FRC Media News after this. Some job descriptions on the latest hot jobs list from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Residential Supervisor, Neuro Restorative, located at 86 Reading Street, is in need of a full-time residential supervisor to coordinate and manage program operations, hiring, training, scheduling, coordinating activities and appointments of individuals with disabilities. Job number 12463164. Semi-local truck driver J.B. Hunt is looking for a full-time Class A semi-local truck driver to service a single customer in the Fall River area making dedicated deliveries to store locations in the Northeast. Job number 12470167. Accountant Full Charge Bookkeeper Midlight Corporation, located at 115 Wardell Street, is looking to hire a full-time accountant full-charge bookkeeper to balance and maintain accurate ledgers through bank reconciliation and maintain the process of closing company books on a monthly basis. Job number 12465454. St. Luke's Health System is looking to fulfill the following full and part-time positions in the Fall River area. Clinical Technician, job number 12465052. Occupational Therapy Team Leader, job number 12464919. Crunch Fitness, located at 450 William S. Canning Boulevard, is also looking to fulfill the following full and part-time positions. Personal Training Sales Manager, job number 12468279. Front Desk Associate, job number 12468630. For more information on these or other positions, visit masshirejobquest.detma.org or call the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. The three candidates running for mayor of Fall River visited FRC Media this week to discuss their plans on leading the city over the next four weeks. We will hear from the candidates on the issues of the campaign. But this week we speak with Erica Scott Pacheco, Paul Coogan, and Mayor Jason Correa on what they learned from running in March's recall election that they can take into this election season. That experience very much informs the current race, but in a lot of ways the current race is completely different. Let's keep in mind the recall was a winner take all, and so we had this very unusual outcome where someone won with only 35% of the vote. We will not have that outcome in this race. Why? Because we have a preliminary election. There's three of us running, but frankly there could be a hundred people running, and it won't matter because the field on September 17th is going to get narrowed down to two and then in November it'll be the, the ultimate winner and the next mayor of Fall River will have to get at least 51% of the vote. And so in the recall election, it was my first time running. I felt like it was a whirlwind. It was seven weeks. So in seven weeks I talked with voters, I got my name out there. And ultimately, 754 people voted for me. I say 754, it was 755 I voted for myself, so that means 754 other people voted for me. On March, in March, I did not know 754 people in Fall River. So I just want to thank each and every one of you. I've met many of you subsequently, door knocking, going door to door, talking to voters. And 
I am running again because I've received so much encouragement. So many people saying, Erica, we need you. We need your leadership. We need someone with a lot of financial acumen and we need someone with your vision and your concrete plans. And so that is what motivates me to keep running um, again in this very different election this time around. You learn a lot from the people and what they're looking for from a city. What, what do people want from a city? And, and what I get is safety, streets that work, um, some growth, um, taxpayer relief. Uh, those are the things that come to the forefront every time you talk to people and it's pretty uniform across the city. Um, what I learned from my opponent was um, at my age, obviously I'm a veteran, um, the next day after the election uh, he fired myself and one of my friends on the school committee, Mark Costa, which then triggered City Councilor Joe Camaro resigning from the building committee at Durfee High School, uh, a committee in which I would consider myself to be an active participant. Um, I went to all the meetings. Um, I offered input. I was, matter of fact, I was on the subcommittee, which went out to the trailers and met directly with the engineers and the builders mm -hmm. to get a feel for what's going on in the school. And I did that because obviously I spent a ton of years in that school. And I had an idea of how a school should flow and what should happen. So the next day, around 12 o'clock, I found out from um, Mark Costa we had been fired. And I was kind of taken back that we didn't even have a 24 hour reprieve and I've never been fired in my life so I was like well that's an interesting way to handle um, an election uh, you're a sore winner uh, I had no idea what happened we did uh, I believe he knows that that was uh, a very bad mistake. What I learned from the results is on that particular day in March uh, you had a special election uh, the people that were motivated to come out were highly engaged voters that were motivated either for another candidate or me. At the bottom half of the ballot, I still had the most people on that particular day to win the election. I don't think that that number will hold true in the final election. I think there will be a lot more voter turnout mm -hmm. in the final election. You've got a significant amount of people that are running for school committee and city council. Uh, there's no primary uh, for those two groups of, uh, of government right now. So I think in the final election on November 5th, although September 17th, is still very, very important to come out and vote for your top choice as mayor. I think the results in, in November are going to be very, very high in terms of voter turnout, which means there's a lot of people that didn't come out in March mm -hmm. uh, to vote in the recall election. And that happens very often in government. So I think there's a lot of voters still out there that believe in Jaisal Carrera. They want to see Jaisal Carrera continue to be the mayor. And I think they're going to come out. I know they're going to come out on September 17th and again on November 5th. And I invite new voters that maybe it's their first time voting. Uh, maybe they haven't voted for me in the past. Maybe they voted against me in March. I invite them to hopefully come out and vote for me as well uh, for the reasons that I've explained. Not for anything else. Not Don't do it for me. Do it for the city. Do it for who you believe is, is moving the city forward in the best positive direction. One note on the preliminary election on September 17th, if you have yet to register to vote in Fall River, you need to do so by next Wednesday, August 28th, to be eligible to vote in September. The elections office will remain open until 8 p.m. Uh, Wednesday, rather, next Wednesday, for last-minute registrations. A second round of aerial spraying to control the potential spread of mosquito-borne diseases is taking place this week in the Fall River area during the evening hours. That from the State Department of Public Health. With the Feast of the Holy Ghost at Kennedy Park kicking off this week, the city's health department director urges festival goers to protect themselves against mosquito bites. Any time, you know, in the evening into the early hours of the morning are when the mosquitoes are most active and that's when it's really important that people are taking the necessary precautions. So wearing long sleeves, um, socks, long pants if they can. I know it's tricky in the summertime, but that, you know, just prevents um, exposed skin. Making sure that people are wearing insect repellent to Typically we suggest with DEET, um, but it's important to check out the instructions and being mindful on infants and children that there are requirements. So you want to be um, cautious when you're using that type of repellent on a child. You want to definitely check the instructions. Are you headed to the feast this weekend? The parking plan for those attending the feast can be found on our website, frcmedianews.org. The Crestbrook Water Drainage Project in the northern part of the city off Eastern Avenue is coming to a close, as we brought up during last week's program. The project was more than just a construction project, however. It also means better water quality in the city.
So a swale is a ditch like you would maybe see on the side of a road that will hold water and convey water over the surface. So it's almost like a pipe that's above ground though. You can see you can see the water kind of traveling through it. So that helps in a couple of different ways. It helps convey the water to somewhere else. So it moves it either from one pipe to another pipe or over the ground surface to another area. There are a couple other benefits of swales. So what we're able to do is some of that water, rather than going into our drainage system, is able to infiltrate into the ground, be used up by the, by the vegetation that's either in the swale or on the sides of the swale. So that puts less water into our actual uh, drainage system. The other benefit that swales create is with the vegetation that's in them, there's a water quality benefit. So it takes out some of the TSS, some of the solids that are in there, the grit and the uh, dirt, and lets that settle out into the swale rather than being pushed into a water body. The free summer lunch program at certain sites throughout the city of Fall River came to an end this week. Here's more. Summer lunch program uh, in the parks and over at the housing authority facilities went very well. We served over 45,000 lunches to date and uh, it is coming to an end on August 21st. So we hope that everyone had a wonderful summer and enjoyed their time at the parks and at their housing developments with all the acti free activities as well as the free lunches. Our agency is also allowed to purchase incentives to give out to the children that participate in the lunch program. It ranges from movie passes to water bottles, um, back little, little knapsacks, uh, pens, pencils, uh, frisbees, you name it, and we hand them out on a weekly basis uh, to all of our sites. Uh, we're very lucky to be uh, allowed to do such, such a wonderful thing, giving back to the children who partic participate in the program. We'll have more FRC Media News after this. Thank you for considering a homeless pet today. I hope you enjoy what you're about to see. And as always, please feel free to contact the shelter before coming down to make sure that the pets you're viewing are still available for adoption. We can be reached at 508-677-9154. Hey, welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. Uh, today we have Ernest. He is a four-year-old uh, blue tick coonhound. He did come in as a stray. Um, for about, he's about 92 pounds, um, but he's actually pretty good on a leash. He does do good with children, and he does also do good with dogs of all sizes. He is very easy going. He likes to go for walks. He does like the water, and he loves to be cuddled, and he doesn't mind handling. So if you want to come down and meet Ernest, um, come down to Forever Paws. We're located at 300 Linwood Street, Fall River, Massachusetts. Today on Hot Dogs and Cool Cats, we have guinea pigs. At Forever Paws, we have six male guinea pigs, which are the ones that you see now. The calico one the, has came from a different litter, and the other boys all came from the same mom. They are eight weeks old. Guinea pigs are very easy to care for. Um, they do require a lot of hay constant. They are grazers. Um, they eat guinea pig pellets along with a mix of fruits and vegetables. Guinea pigs are very social animals and they do do better in pairs. If you're interested in adopting a guinea pig or want to learn more about them, Come on down to Forever Paws, 300 Linwood Street in Fall River, Mass. And we would be glad to help you out. We have plenty to choose from. The Fall River Salvation Army held its third annual block party at its Bedford Street location over the weekend. Here's how the free event panned out. You know, our goal here is to provide a, a safe, fun, free day for all the children. Our first year, we put out around 225 people. And now, if you look, we have, we've been doing around five to 600 people. We've been blessed that uh, Amber Nights Entertainment has come all three years and provided the music for us. Fall River PD and Fall River Fire Department have spent their Saturdays here showing the kids the fire trucks and the police cruisers. We've been blessed uh, Gold Medal Bakery 
donated all our hot dog rolls this year. Um, it's just a great event for everyone. Today was also our backpack distribution. We gave out 250 plus backpacks and school supplies that were donated by several members of the community. This year was the fewest backpacks that we had. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't raise as many as we did in previous years. So if, uh, if possible, if the community could uh, come together and next year we could increase that number of backpacks. I think it's very important for every child to be able to start the school year with what they need to learn. Uh, I mean, the best way to fight poverty is with education. And finally this week, St. Vincent Services in the north end of the city held its 14th annual motorcycle run fundraiser this past weekend. Here's Ian Spence on why he decided to ride to support the mission of St. Vincent's. To help the children out and enjoy a nice day of riding motorcycles and getting camaraderie of the community and forever and surrounding areas and have some food, whatever they're making today. We just, we have to pay $25 to register and certain other maybe foundations might, but we pay just to eat and get a shirt and you know, sponsor the kids. How many miles? If I had to say about 50 miles. Like, tell us a little bit about what the ride's like. It was all back roads, windy roads through Berkeley, Lakeville, um, all around like surrounding towns, but all back roads, all windy roads in the, in the trees. And that's how it's fun, you know, riding on windy roads, so you just don't want straightaways and, um, you know, traffic and all that, so it was all back roads. Yeah, I've been here like three times in a row uh, every year, so Do you do fun. other ones? Oh, uh, yes, plenty, yeah. Tell us about your bike. Uh, my bike's a 1979 shovel head, that's the, the engine style, it's uh, 40 years old, but it's got a new paint job, but it's an old school bike. That'll do it for this edition of FRC Media News. Watch FRC Media News Thursdays and Fridays at 6 p.m. And you can check out all our news online 24-7 FRCMediaNews.org. For all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Thibault. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the feast. We'll see you next Thursday.